Hello everyone, Dan Swift here, founder and CEO at Numentum. And welcome to the speaker series, where we spotlight some of the most interesting minds in the world of revenue generation. At Numentum, we help forward-thinking B2B organizations create better buyer experiences and deliver new momentum to their revenue engine. On this episode of the speaker series, we speak with Joe Marcin, Chief Revenue Officer at Kyriba. We have a great conversation around the art and science of selling, the need for relentless perseverance, and what a sales athlete is. Joe, welcome to the speaker series. Thank you, Dan. Pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Well, really looking forward to this, Joe. We've known each other now for about three or four months and really excited to dig into your experience um, today. So let's jump straight in. Why don't you start by sharing a little bit about Kyriba and what Kyriba is essentially doing to solve for your customers? Sure. Um, so I joined Kyriba uh, just about a year ago. Um, Kariba is in the fintech space. Um, they've been in business for about 20 years. Um, we've got about 1,000 employees across 14 um, offices worldwide. And they're about 200 million in revenue. So decent size um, software business um, that's, uh, that's emerged in the fintech space. In terms of what we do, it really boils down to five essential questions that we help our customers answer. The first three are going to sound very trivial, uh, but you'd be amazed at how many companies cannot answer these questions. The first one is, how much money do I have? Sounds pretty basic. Many companies cannot answer that question. Second question is, where is it? Where is all of my money? What bank accounts is it in? What, what legal entities is it in? Um, what countries is it located in? Oftentimes, they can't answer that question very clearly. The third one is, how much money am I going to have in the future? So the ability to forecast and project how much money you'll have at some future point in time to make sure you can do simple things like make the payroll and pay your bills. Very, very essential basic questions. Those are the first three. The next two um, that we help companies answer are a little bit more advanced, uh, but really build on the answer to the first three. So the fourth question is, how do I optimize the way in which I move money um, across legal entities, across uh, borders, um, across financial institutions in such a way that I minimize risk and I, and I minimize cost? Um, there's obviously costs associated with currency um, translation. There's costs associated with moving things between different companies. There's, there's costs associated with moving things between banks. And so the ability to optimize that is something that we do very, very well. And then the fifth essential question that we answer for our question is, how do I leverage my liquid assets um, as a growth um, vehicle for the business? So yes, we need to keep a certain amount of cash on hand so that we can do things like pay our bills, but while it's sitting there waiting to be spent, how can I use that money to ultimately help our business grow? So if you boil it down to sort of the five things that we do, it's really that in a nutshell. Wow. So, you, so you're coming up to essentially the end of, I guess, 12 months, right, with Kyrie. Is that about right? That's about right. Yep. Okay. So in your profile on LinkedIn, I read and I quote, my primary focus is to consistently exceed revenue growth targets while ensuring outstanding customer experiences and delivering positive business outcomes. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, what are some of the, uh, the big initiatives, Joe, that you've been working on since joining Kyriba? Yeah, we've, we've had a lot of things in motion over the last year, but if I could kind of boil it down to one area of focus, it's really around strengthening our foundation through the introduction of the science of selling. Hmm. So Kariba has done some amazing things in its 20 years of existence to get to where it is today. Um, in order to get to its next growth milestone, we need to be able to do some things a little bit more efficiently to build scale. And so a lot of what we're doing is hardening that foundation, adding some science into the way that we operate so that ultimately we can scale with more efficiency over time. Um, some examples of areas where we've invested include sales enablement. We've really reimagined that entire experience from onboarding all the way through continued education. Um, prior to this year, um, sellers joined our company and they went through two weeks of boot camp. They learned everything they would ever need to know about Kariba. And then they were set off to the field to go do great things. Um, unfortunately, many of them forgot most of what they learned in their first two weeks. And um, you know, they, they sort of struggled through their initial deals and needed a lot of support. And so we've adopted a different approach, um, which really has a more, uh, more of a just-in-time delivery of knowledge so that we're aligning the education with when a seller is going to actually use it. 
For example, on your first days, you don't need to know how to build a quote in our CRM system because you're not working on a deal. But about 90 to 120 days in, you're going to really need to understand how that works. And so we've sort of restructured and reimagined the way that the onboarding experience works to align when knowledge is required um, with the delivery of that knowledge for the seller. Um, it's also, you know, kind of ties into what we're doing here with Empire Selling. Um, one of the things Kariba has done very well in the past is sell through, through traditional channels, um, but they haven't really embraced the modern selling platforms like what we're doing with Empire Selling through LinkedIn Sales Navigator and some other digital mediums. And so the investment we're making with Empire is enabling us to modernize the way we engage with our target audience and enable our sellers to expand the repertoire of techniques that they use in order to engage with our buyers. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I think when you and I both started out in our careers, um, I would have loved to have something like Empire Selling um, at my disposal, but I do want to take you back to the beginning. So when you started out your career more than 20 years ago, um, I read that you started out as a sales engineer. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, how did you, or what was the transition like, or, or how did you facilitate that from being a, a sales engineer, essentially, to carrying a bag? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. It was not, um, it was not a career path that I was, um, I was uh, set to, uh, to pursue. Um, I had a uh, technical background. I enjoyed being close to the technology. Had never envisioned my sa- myself in a sales capacity at all. Um, you know, a lot of people say that I've been lucky in sort of my career, but I would actually define luck as the intersection point of opportunity and preparation. Um, there was a moment in time earlier in my career where I happened to be in the right place at the right time, um, but really it, it was a place where there was an opportunity and I had prepared to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Now, I didn't know the opportunity was going to present itself in the way that it did, um, but ultimately it led to me making that transition from um, more of a technical selling role into an account management role and later into sales leadership. Um, it's a longer story, but um, in 2001, Intel had become an iconic brand in Silicon Valley. And the head of worldwide sales and marketing at the time was a gentleman named Mike Splinter. And he invited me to join him on stage for his keynote presentation at TechX, um, where we presented in front of a live audience of 3,000 people and talked about a partnership between the startup that I was a part of and Intel. And mm. really from that point forward, the rest is history. Um, as we finished the presentation and we were walking off the stage, he said, hey, kid, you should think about sales someday. You're pretty good at this. And of course, I didn't really think much of it when he said it. Uh, but when my leadership team saw the recording and they said, you're no longer part of the pre-sales team, <laughs> you're now a sales <laughs> team. Um, so that was kind of the, the transition for me. And again, the story is, uh, there's a little bit more depth to it, but that's sort of the, the, the essence of what happened. I love it. And, and then early on in your career, um, speaking on stage or tag team at presentation in front of 3,000 people, enjoyed it? Terrified? How, how did that feel? Actually, I enjoyed it. Um, it was my first um, public demonstration. I was actually demonstrating some technology that we co-innovated with Intel. And uh, during the dress rehearsal the night before, um, some Intel employees were supposed to do the demonstration. And during the dress rehearsal, they were struggling to really um, bring the demonstration to life. And that's ultimately mm-hmm. how I got invited to the stage to participate the next day. Um, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. Um, I had fortunately been pushed into public speaking engagements very early in life by my parents. Um, and so I had developed this comfort level of being in front of an audience where once you kind of know the script and you know the basics of how to operate on the stage, the rest is easy. Yeah, it's so true. I remember when I first started doing public speaking, I was personally terrified of it. And you kind of, when you learn your material and you learn the flow and you learn the, the experience, it, it does come natural. But <laughs> I was terrified to begin with, Joe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> seen something on your, your LinkedIn profile as we were chatting, right? So there's a quote there and it says, dreams are just a blueprint for reality. Only you can make them come true. So, so tell me about this. Uh, w- what does that quote mean to you? So, you know, if I kind of think about some of the great leaders in history, Winston Churchill once said that, you know, a, um, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. And that's always been sort of a foundational um, thought for me as, I, as I've entered the business world. And even really before that, I always had plans uh, growing up as a, as a student, 
um, planning my academic career and how I was going to get to the university that I wanted to get to once I was at university. How do I get the job that I want? Once I get the job that I want, how do I progress to the leadership roles that I want, et cetera? So there's always been sort of a plan or a blueprint um, behind how all of that happens. Um, at the end of the day, um, your imagination or your dreams ultimately are where those blueprints sit. And so those blueprints for success really only require the courage for you to embrace them and make them real. Um, you know, I've traveled a lot around the world. Um, I think I've shared with you, Dan, I've been in a lot of different countries and had a chance to immerse myself in a few different cultures. The Finnish people talk about a term called Saisu, um, which if you watch Disney films has recently, you know, come to the surface as the name of a famous dragon. Um, mm -hmm. Before that, though, it had a very different sort of connotation in the Finnish culture. And Saisu is this notion of relentless perseverance. So when grit and determination kind of reach their limit, Saisu perseveres and pushes through all of that. You ultimately reach success irregardless of the hurdles in front of you. And so as I sort of think about, you know, um, getting to where I've been able to go in life and, and accomplishing some of the things I've been able to in my career, a lot of it had to do with um, the dream that I had, translating that into a plan for success or a blueprint, um, and then having the perseverance and the courage to um, follow the North Star that would ultimately take me to where I was going. So you're... Let's talk about that. So your transition then from sales engineer to carrying a bag to then moving into sales leadership. So um, you were carrying a bag for a number of years. When how how did you decide that you wanted to move into sales leadership? What 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 made you decide that? I think I've always wanted to sales. The sales part of it, you know, came later in life um, because that was not a career path that I was originally pursuing. But leadership has always been um, you know something that I've been in pursuit of. Um, when I was even a child, um, I had leadership roles in sports and mm -hmm. academics and various other parts of life. Um, and as I moved into the professional world, you know, pursuing leadership roles was something that I was, uh, I was always very interested in. I think, the, you know, the interesting part is I made the transition into professional leadership was the delineation between leadership and management. Um, mm -hmm. And that was something I don't think I had a full appreciation for early in my career as I took on some of my first leadership roles. Leadership is a um, more of a more of a natural thing. I think many of us um, have that that you know that capacity inside, uh, but understanding how to actually manage a team and the things that are required to motivate people to achieve their peak potential is something that I had not appreciated in some of my early roles and something I've developed over time. And I think your your first leadership position, Oracle, two thousand and ten, two thousand and eleven, kind of time. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Well, wow. so you've fast tracked through from the, from the leadership days to where you are today. So I want to dig into that a little bit more um, in terms of what you've learned about leadership. Um, what are the one or two things, maybe three things, whatever you've got that you might want to share um, with people listening today, particularly folks who maybe are in those sales positions and carrying a bag today and maybe aspiring to, to be a sales leader? What, what are the one or two things you might want to share with them? Yeah, it has been um, a rapid progression for me over the last um, you know, decade or so, and it's been uh, it's been incredibly rewarding. Um, I think, you know, as I think about leadership in the progression from you know, being an individual contributor to various levels of leadership, um, I think it really kind of comes down to a few simple things. Um, first and foremost, to have a genuine passion um, and, and, and empathy for the people that you lead. Mm. Um, I've always believed in sort of putting them first. Um, so a lot of times when I draw an organizational chart, as an example, the team's at the mm -hmm. top and the pyramid is upside down. I'm at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here as an asset to support and enable them and ultimately help each and every one of them reach success. Um, in one of my first uh, global leadership roles, I had a stated goal that 100% of my sales team was going to achieve President's Club. Right. Um, and although we didn't quite make the goal, I knew we had done something very, very special when I had a seller come to me at the very end of December as we were closing out Q4. And that seller said to me, I've already reached my number for the year, but this other seller on the team is at 91%. Their deal ended up you know, falling apart. They're not going to make it. Is there any way I can give my last deal to that seller so they get credit and join President's Club? And so it's an example to illustrate, right? But those are the kinds of cultural things that you can't yeah. quantify. And when you create that, you, you build some very kind of special momentum inside of a business. And that's, I think, a key element to having a high performing sales team. So I could go on and on about, you know, some of the things that <laughs> I've learned in the different leadership roles. But I think that gives you kind of an idea of the philosophy or the, 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 the mindset that I have around it. 
now my mind is racing. Is that person in a sales leadership position now, do you know, who, who offered that quota at retirement? They are, they are. And, um, and just for the are. record, I made both sellers whole. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Amazing, amazing. So let's talk a little bit about the positions you've held then. So Oracle, Click Software, Vindevo, now Kariba. Um, I think in my career, and I think of a lot of people we chat with on the Empire Speaker Series, careers are, are seldom linear. And there's often sort of pivotal moments in someone's career, which genuinely change the trajectory of that person's career. So when you look back, are there one or two moments that may have changed the trajectory? Because you're now a CRO of one of the leading organizations in the world in this category. So, so talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, I think in every career step that I've taken, um, there there was sort of a pivotal moment for me. Um, in most cases, I, I, I've progressed fairly quickly in my career through different leadership roles, and and because of that, at each step and almost nearly each step, um, someone ultimately had to take a chance on me. They had to see mm. the potential. They had to see um, the willingness and the drive that I have to reach success, regardless of the obstacles in front of me. Going back to the the Sisu, you know, sort of mentality in the mm-hmm. Finnish culture. Um, and, and said, you know what, he hasn't, he doesn't necessarily have the experience. Maybe he hasn't done this specific thing before, but we're going to place a bet on Joe. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to back him. We're going to support him. We're going to, you know, elevate him and enable him to be successful in this role. And so I, you know, as I sort of think about the different steps I've taken in my career, it's largely been based on people who have, you know, who have, who have taken a chance. Um, they've seen mm-hmm. something they've seen the potential and they said, I want to invest. I want to see where this can go. And a great example is when I was at Click Software, when I joined that company uh, back in 2017, I was leading North America sales. And I came into a business that had been around for about 30 years. Um, they had sort of plateaued in terms of their growth. They're about a $100 million business, fantastic product, um, incredible market opportunity, but really um, not a very well-run well and disciplined sort of you know, sales execution engine. And so as I came in, it was a little bit of a turnaround scenario with the team in North America. And over the course of the first four quarters that I was there, we were able to grow bookings by a thousand percent. Now, I'd love to say that was all me, but it wasn't. It was a team effort. It was a massive team effort. We did a lot of work in a really short period of time to go make that happen. Um, But at the end of the day, we had a fantastic outcome. And, um, you know, at the end of the year, the, um, you know, the the CEO said, hey, you've, you've, you've obviously created a formula that works here inside of this company. How would you feel about taking that formula and, and using that in all the other corners of the globe, right? And so it was an opportunity for me to elevate into an international global selling role um, where I didn't have that experience. Um, and that was a CEO taking a chance on me based on what he had seen and the potential for being able to repeat what I did in North America on a global basis. So is you very... Um... Uh, I, I like how you're saying that uh, people are taking a chance on you, but you're, you're creating essentially those chances by performing at the kind of level that you performed. And it's hard for people not to see that and then take a chance on you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And I mean, it kind of goes back to, again, my definition of luck, right? Some people mm-hmm. would say I've been lucky. Um, no, I haven't. I've been prepared oh. um, and I've been in the right place when there's an opportunity, right? So that intersection of preparation and opportunity is where you ultimately create your own success. I won't even call it luck. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how you've got this success and, and how you, you think about the art and science of selling. So there's an article um, that you published, uh, and in it you talk a lot about the combination of selling being an art, but also um, a science. So how do you manifest this in, in your organization? Sure. I mean, coming from a more technical background, I've always slanted in the direction of the science of selling. So when I say mm-hmm. the science of selling, I'm talking about the combination of process and data to drive predictable outcomes. Um, I think there's a, um, any good salesperson or sales team has a formula for success. It's something that can be repeatable. It's something that can be taught. Um, it's something that can ultimately translate to a predictable result. And so I've, um, you know, I've developed the playbook um, borrowing from, you know, various roles and organizations that I've had across my career um, to take the best of everyone's, you know, everyone's formula and create my own, um, which I think has been a key to success in my leadership roles. In that formula, we focus very much on the process, the discipline and the structure needed to build a highly scalable organization that's gonna ultimately drive the kind of growth result that the company is looking for. Now, the art isn't what a lot of people think. A lot of people think the art of selling is about fancy dinners and golf Mm -hmm. golf outings and all of those sorts of things. And I'm sure all of that is fun too. Um, But when I talk about the art of selling, I'm talking about the way in which you make the science not feel like science. 
Customers don't like to be sold. Customers don't like to be in a process. Customers like to go buy things. Customers like to solve problems and work with you know, t- uh, technology providers that can help them with that journey. Um, they need guidance. They need coaching. Many of them have never bought technology before and they need our consultative advice, but they don't need to feel like there's a process or a, a science that's being mm. applied. So the art is really in the way that you take the science and you apply that so that customers get to the outcome they're looking for without feeling like they went from step one to step two to step three and got to an outcome that you were looking for. So I'm feeling like you've had some pretty good guidance um, over the years. What is um, the best sales advice that you've ever received? It'll sound funny, but I think the best advice I ever received was stop selling. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, as, as I, you know, as I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, right, everyone likes to buy things, but nobody mm-hmm. likes to be sold. Um, and I, earlier in my career, someone told me, you need to stop selling. You need to ask questions. You need to seek to understand the problems that a customer has. You need to have empathy with your target audience. And if you do that well, ultimately, the customers will sell themselves. Mm. Um, so if you do the right kind of discovery and you help your customers understand the pain, you help the customers understand that future state scenario, and you build them a bridge, you build them a path to get from where they are today to where they'd like to be, they'll sell themselves on the outcome and the solution that's going to take to get to the, to the outcome that they deserve. So it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, it seems kind of, uh, you know, counterintuitive to me when it was first shared, but Mm -hmm. over the course of my career, it became more and more obvious that you do need to stop selling in order to sell. I remember I I asked, um, someone asked me the same question a moment, a a couple of weeks back. And, um, and someone gave me some fantastic advice. They said, when you're selling, this was early on in my career, when I was selling, I was almost in this different mode to who I was as a human being. And they said to me, stop being this other person, just be yourself have a conversation, Um, obviously know what you're bringing to the market and know the value and and all of that, Um, but just be human. Um, So I think a combination, right, of just remembering that the people you're selling to are also human beings um, and don't sell to them to your point, just bring value, engage, have the conversation, know how to validate it with all the proof points, et cetera. But uh, yeah, that, that was a moment for me too. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, there was another term that was used um, earlier in my career as well that I think is is relative here. Um, It said, stop thinking about yourself as a salesperson and start thinking about yourself as a buying facilitator. So to your point, adding value, bringing something to the equation that, you know, your customers might have not otherwise uncovered on their own. When you start to do that, you, you start to create that value. And ultimately, again, customers will sell themselves on the solution. I loved it when we launched the program um, with Kariba and for everyone listening, Joe joined the, the call and we, we asked him a lot of questions around um, what is it like to be sold to as an, as an executive in today's world and um, how, much, how much do you receive from the sellers and what is the quality of the outreach that you get from salespeople? And, um, and it wasn't particularly good from the conversation we had. Um, but one of the things that, um, that really rung true to me is, um, is when, when, when you're reaching out to an executive or a senior person like yourself, um, you've got you to bring value, but you've got to be human in that, in that moment as well and differentiate yourself from, from all of the other people. So how do you differentiate yourself? Um, one of the things that I've read, and you, you mentioned this a lot when we're, we're having calls with the Cariba team, sales athletes. It's a team, a term, I should say, that you, uh, you use a lot. Um, you don't call them account executives or account managers. You call them sales athletes. Um, and there's a LinkedIn article for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about Joe's uh, view on this, but I'm going to ask you, Joe, um, why? Why do you call them that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of people will refer to them as sales reps. Um, some people will go as far as to call them sales executives or account executives, account managers. Um, I truly view the team as a team of sales athletes, um, and it's an important distinction for me. As I think about, you know, what we do in our professional careers, it's not, it's not really different than what anyone does who's trying to reach their peak potential in what they focus on. Um, everybody has the potential to do great things, but it requires an investment in yourself to ultimately get to your peak potential. You have to develop, you have to grow, you have to push yourself beyond your limits and your boundaries And you have to be able to accept that sometimes you're going to fail. That's how you grow. 
Um, and so when I sort of think about what professional athletes do, they train, they practice, they, they do a lot of things to prepare for game day. Um, I think that applies very directly to what we do in sales. Um, if you're preparing for your meeting and you're figuring out what your talking points are on the elevator ride up to the top floor, <laughs> you failed. Um, you're going to show up unprepared. You're going to wing it, and ultimately, you're going to come off. You're going to come uh, uh, come off as being a salesperson instead of that buying facilitator because you've not planned how to guide your customer on their journey to the next step in their process. Um, so I very much view it that way. And, uh, you know, I sort of think about, you know, what, what the best sales athletes have ever done in my career. They prepare. They take the time to do the dry run of the demo. They take the time to rehearse their presentation. They take the time to review the presentation with their management team before they go present it to the customer. Um, they aren't spending time at the spa. They're in the gym, you know, developing, practicing, and truly building those skill sets um, so that when they are on the field for game day, when they're in front of the customer in the boardroom and they're asking for the business, um, they're executing at 100% of their peak potential. So follow on question from that. If you're being brought into um, a customer or a prospect meeting by a rep um, and your expectation is that they've done the due diligence and they're prepped, um, what are you expecting from a sales rep in terms of prepping you? And how long before that, that customer or that prospect interaction are you expecting to be briefed? It, I like it to be within close close proximity um, because mm -hmm. I move fast. I have a lot of things mm -hmm. going on. And if it, if it's, if there's too much time in between the briefing and, and the call with the customer, you know, I'll forget some of the, the salient points mm -hmm. that are important. Um, but in terms of my preparation, what's really important for me is to have situational awareness. Yes, mm -hmm. of course, I'm happy to show up to a meeting and express my executive commitment and shake a bunch of hands. But at the end of the day, that doesn't add a lot of value. When I get on a plane, now that we're starting to travel again, or even before that, when I spend time on Zoom, I want to make sure I help my team move the needle on what they're trying to accomplish with the customer, whether it's a deal or it's with a deployment that the customer is, is in the middle of, whatever the topic might be, I want to make sure we progress and we move forward in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, I need situational awareness. And I do that through an executive briefing document. It's very simple. It's a front and a back, very basic information that I need the salesperson to help me understand about where we are with that customer and what success looks like at the end of the conversation. And once I have that, we'll do a call. They'll brief me on it. They'll take me through it. They'll answer my questions. And then I'm ready to go. Yeah. I was in an elevator about a month ago um, in the city. And uh, two gentlemen got into the elevator. It sounds like a joke. This. Two gentlemen got into the elevator. And um, one was clearly the manager. One was clearly the rep. And the manager's like, right, so who are we meeting? What are we doing? Um, what do I need to do? <laughs> I remember just chuckling to myself thinking this is going to be an absolute disaster. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you've nailed it. Prep your executive. So let's talk a little bit about passion. I'm feeling it. I think I might know the answer to this, but what, are you, what drives you? What are you passionate about? I have a, um, a very competitive spirit. And so I'm passionate about winning. Um, mm -hmm. Almost everything I do in life, um, and, and you know, really for my entire life, um, has been centered around some kind of competitive element. Um, it's just something that drives me. It's something that pushes me to um, uh, excel beyond the boundaries of the limits of uh, what I've accomplished in the past. Mm -hmm. um, for me, this, this really translates into how I accept new challenges, both in my personal life and my professional life. Uh, but it also forms the basis for how I coach my high-performing teams mm. um, and ultimately help people build a roadmap to unlock their peak potential. Um, at the end of the day, each individual has a capability and a gift, um, and I like to help people discover what that is and figure out how to amplify that to its maximum potential um, in whatever they do. And so um, when I think about, you know, kind of my competitive spirit and, and my passion around winning, um, that's what's driving me. I like to help people, you know, set their goals and help them go achieve what those goals are. So with that highly competitive spirit, what frustrates you? There's got to be, there's got to be some stuff that frustrates you. There, there are maybe a few things, Dan. Um, <laughs> I'm a pretty open-minded person um, and I do have a lot of patience. Um, so there's not a lot in life that really does frustrate me. Um, but I would say in a business setting, one of the things that frustrates me is when I see people being satisfied with not doing their best. Mm. Um, and I'm not going to go as far as to say mediocrity, but when people, you know, deliver a result that they know is not the best result they can deliver, and they're okay with that. For me, that's frustrating. I like to help people develop and grow and ultimately achieve 
greater results. Um, and, and it is frustrating to see when people are comfortable um, settling yeah. for whatever result they were able to achieve. Like I said, um, we're all giving gifts. And I believe one of our purposes in life is to be able to share those gifts with the rest of the world. Um, so for me, I, even though they're frustrating moments, they're also coachable moments. And I'll use those um, times to work with my team and help them really think through how do they ultimately set, um, you know, set goals that they can hold themselves accountable to that really bring their, um, their strengths to, you know, to, 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 um, to the surface so people can see what those are. And, and you said it earlier on, you said, um, you know, you, or I think I might've said it based on what you said, you create opportunity for yourself based on giving your best and giving your all and giving you hundred percent. And people see that and that then gives you the opportunity or people give you the opportunity. It's not luck, you created it. So again, I think for people listening today, um, think about the deliverables that you've got coming up, whether it's this week, next month, this quarter, whatever it is. And are you 100% giving everything to it or, or not? And if not, then you get, you're going to get <laughs> what the level of effort is that you put in. So if you're putting a C minus in, you're probably going to get a C minus back from that deliverable. Um, one thing I do right. want to, I want to ask you a little bit about outside of work, though, because um, part of the Empire Speaker series, right, is, is getting to know a little bit about the human being behind the title. And on your LinkedIn profile, you actually say, and again, I quote, outside of the office, I enjoy spending most of my time seeing the world through the eyes of my two daughters, eight and three. Um, so I've got to ask you, I'm a, I'm a father too, as you know, but what have you learned about yourself since becoming a father? You know, it's interesting, Dan, I've probably learned more about myself and more about um, life in general since becoming a father. It's, it's truly amazing to see the world through, through children's eyes. Um, I've worked with children even, uh, even since high school, um, when I supported children that were in uh, you know, needy situations, um, were in um, you know, family situations that were less than ideal, held support groups um, you know, for, those, uh, for those kids. And I've always enjoyed working with children, but as a father, you see it from a whole different angle. Um, and for me, it's been um, in incredibly illuminating. Um, I sort of think about, you know, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, building high performing teams and helping people reach their peak potential. I think one of the things I learned most um, as it relates to, um, you know, to the business world through my, through my um, daughters was the fact that everyone's peak potential is actually different. Um, prior to being a father, I tended to kind of measure everyone against a, um, a standard. Um, everyone had the same KPI, they all had the same goal, and I measured success against that standardized metric. Now, the fact that you have standardized metrics is, is not necessarily bad, but I think you have to have a recognition that everyone's potential within the context of that met metric is different. And so measuring people against what their potential is instead of measuring them against what some standard is, I think is really, really important in terms of how you build dynamic, diverse, and high-performing teams. And that's something I was able to, to actually learn from my children. Um, you know, you have, you have, I have two daughters, you have children, um, you think they're going to be the same, you're parenting them the same yes. way, and you find out they're wildly different. Yeah. Um, they have strengths and weaknesses, and they sometimes complement each other and sometimes clash. Um, but it was eye-opening for me because I started to think about how I was evaluating one over the other when we would do an activity or we would engage in something together. And I was like, you know, that she is doing her best. It's, it's you know, just because it's not the same as, as her sister doesn't mean she's not doing her best. She just reached her peak potential in that particular activity. So anyways, it was a long answer to your question, but I've learned a lot through the eyes of my children. And certainly that one in particular applies to the way that I've worked with coaching and developing teams. I love it. I think the thing I've learned the most in negotiation, <laughs> watching them negotiate with me for what they want to do or what they want <laughs> to eat or whatever, and then watching them negotiate with each other is absolutely fascinating. But um. Anywho, you're, you're, all right. Yeah, and you're, you're right, Dan. And actually, that reminds me of something funny, if you don't mind me right. sharing. Yeah, go, go, um, go. I had an opportunity to run a forecast call one time while the, while the kids were with me. And um, they were listening in and they're listening to, you know, what people are talking about with the deals. And my, I remember my oldest daughter got on camera and she says, Daddy, I think that deal is a pretty stinky deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was just, it was great because, you know, you, you, you kind of get the, the brutal honesty that a child sees and hears, um, not really understanding the business context at all of what we're, you know, what we're doing, but the ability to hear and listen to the way another human is communicating about something and being able to say, you know what, I don't think that one's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on highly unlikely to close within this quarter. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Thank you.
we're running short on time, but I do like to wrap these uh, these sessions with a with a quick fire round. Are you open to uh, a few questions here, Joe? Sure, let's do it. All right. So I've got five or six for you. Let's see how much time we've got. Number one, who's your hero? I don't know if I could pick one. I, I'd have to say there's two, and they're they're um, they're equal in my mind. It's my mom and dad. Um, my parents have been. Um, a guiding light for me throughout my life. They've been an example of um, someone I aspire to be um, from the very beginning. Um, and I'm incredibly, um, um, incredibly grateful for all the things that they've done for me along the way to be able to get to where I am today in my professional life as well. My mom and dad met when they were 16 years old. They were high school sweethearts. Um, they fell in love. They were together for five or six years. They've been married for 46 years, I think, at this point. Um, and they have been absolute role models for me and everything I've done in my life. So if, if I had to pick a hero, it would be, it would be my parents. Amazing. Beautiful. Um, completely switching gears. The best sales kickoff that you've ever been to. Wow. That is switching gears. <laughs> um, let's see. I would have to say this goes back to probably January, 2017. Um, I had just joined Click Software. My very first day was SKO. Um, I had been brought on board to lead um, North America sales, got introduced to the team, got indoctrinated with what the business did. Um, we were a very international company, so I got to meet a lot of my counterparts from all over the world. And it was a world-class kickoff in the sense that um, they focused very much on boot camp. Um, so I learned a ton. It was a lot of fun, too, um, and probably one of the best well-run sales kickoffs I've seen in my career. Amazing. Now you're coming off the back for this session of 10 days of international travel. So are you a morning lark or are you a night owl? I don't know, Dan. I think um, <laughs> I don't really know what sleep is. <laughs> I tend to, um, you know, I tend to kind of be both. Um, in a global role, you're covering lots of time zones. Um, Sundays don't exist. Holidays don't exist. Um, that's, that's part of the role. Um, and so there are often late nights, uh, in particular, when I'm working with um, Asia, there's often early mornings when I'm working with Europe and I'm here. Um, but, you know, you, you try to strike the balance, right? Um, you mm -hmm. can't always, um, you, you, you can't always get the sleep when you would like to, um, but you find a way to do it. And, and you've traveled a lot, as we've just mentioned. Uh, is there a favorite city, favorite world, um, or any country that you most like to visit? Yeah, I've been um, I've I've been around quite a bit. So I've I've traveled to more than four dozen countries, and I've been on oh, wow. every continent except Antarctica, um, and that's that's still on my to do list. I will get down <laughs> to see the penguin at some point. <laughs> Love it. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been around quite a bit, and I love um, many places I've been. I mean, Italy, Paris. Um, you know, there's, there's there's countless places across Europe where I've enjoyed my time. I love Tokyo. Have a fantastic mm -hmm. time there. Sydney's beautiful. Melbourne's beautiful in Australia. Um, Hong Kong is this enchanting city. Um, it, it's great. I mean, I've been all over the place. Um, but if I really had to pick, you know, a place that I love most, it's here. It's in the USA. Um, I, I can't tell you how good it feels when I hit the escalator, stepping off a plane, I'm heading down to um, Customs and Immigration in Los Angeles, and I see the American flag and it says, welcome, you know, welcome to America. Um, it feels great to be home. So Amazing. Um, with all the travel, all the work, the late nights, the early mornings, how many cups of coffee are you on a day, Joe? <laughs> I thought they only served it by the pot. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure if I can count the cups, but um, I probably drink more coffee than I'd like to admit. Um, although I've uh, I've definitely uh, tapered that back in uh, in in more recent years. Um, but uh, yeah, I de I'm definitely uh, on caffeine fairly often. Love it. And and uh, your opportunity, uh, the favorite manager that you've ever had. Who is that, and why actually? That's a good question. Um, I've had some really great leaders and mentors across my career. Um, some, some people that I'm um, incredibly lucky to have known and have uh, and still know um, and have been able to work with. But I think if I had to pick one, um, it would probably be the first um, VP of sales I ever worked with. This goes back really, really early in my career when I make that transition from technical sales into sales. Mm -hmm. Um, his name was, uh, is Lou Leuzzi. He's based in uh, Chicago. Um, just gave me an incredible grounding on all the basics of, of selling. Um, and there's oftentimes, even today, where you know, I'll be in a situation and I'll be thinking about the right way to handle that situation or what the right thing is to do when I'm coaching my team. And it's the fundamentals that he had taught me some 20 years ago that I'm actually resurfacing and using today. Um, so if I sort of think about you know, someone who's sort of been that, you know, that, um, you know, that beacon for me in my professional world, um, it, it's definitely Lou. 
Amazing. Love it. And then the final question I've got for you is what, what would you tell your younger self? Wow, that's a loaded question, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could probably spend a couple hours on that. Um, let's see. I, I think if I could boil it down to, you know, one or two maybe sound bites, um, I, I would tell my younger self to find the balance. Um, you know, work um, to live, but don't live to work. I, I've put a lot into getting to where I wanted to go in my career because I am very goal oriented. I'm very driven. I'm very competitive, like we talked about. Um, but at the end of the day, as I reflect back on all of that, um, you know, there's there's a path that we're all on. And um, I think if you if you do the right things and you stay true to your North Star, you're going to get to where you're going. Um, and so if I could go back and do some things differently, Maybe I wouldn't have put in some of those all-nighters. Maybe I wouldn't have done some of the extra steps that I took that probably were unnecessary because I thought if someone saw me working hard, I'd be able to move into that next role. I'm mm -hmm. not saying you shouldn't work hard. You should, absolutely. Um, but I think there's a balance there, right? And I think um, if I could, if I could uh, go back and tell my younger self um, and give, you know, give myself a little bit of advice, it would be that, it would be find that balance. Well, Joe, unfortunately, we are up on time. But Joe, thank you so much for joining. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I did too, Jan. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And um, I look forward to continuing to work with you.